Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Sure, we've all received creepy phone calls from a random prankster, but what about those unexplained phone calls that led to tragedy? Those calls which foretold of death approaching, or even more chilling, a phone call from the ghost of someone who's already dead? Over the years, the wonderful invention of Alexander Graham Bell has not always been used to reach out to friends and family, but instead, at times, has become the instrument employed to terrorize, horrify, or mystify. Phone calls have been made by killers to contact their victims' families, taunting them. Others have taken prank calls to the next level, and people have come up missing or worse, dead. Sometimes there is no explanation whatsoever about a phone call that chills you to the bone. Tonight, I'll share some of the strangest, most bizarre phone calls ever received, and for some, the crimes to which they're attached. I'm calling this episode Calling 555 Terror. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. While you're listening, you might want to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can sign up for the newsletter, find transcripts of the episodes, paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, watch old horror movies. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Coming up in this episode, we usually expect our horror stories to involve a haunted house or a fog-shrouded graveyard, but in modern times, some of the most terrifying stories have begun with a simple phone call. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. You don't need a haunted house, a cemetery, or even a dark road through the woods to experience terror. Sometimes terror comes to you via a phone call. At around 10 a.m. on November 22, 1963, a call was made to an operator in Oxnard, California. A woman began whispering to the operator. She stated that the president was going to die at approximately 10.10 a.m. The time came and went, and as far as the operator was concerned, the president was still alive. Then the mysterious caller changed the time of the president's supposed death to 10.30. The switchboard operator, believing to be a victim of a prank call, disconnected the line. President John F. Kennedy was in Dallas, Texas, riding in a motorcade on that fateful day. He was shot and killed at 12.30 p.m., which was 10.30 a.m. in California, where the call was made. The telephone company was never able to trace the calls, and the case of the anonymous telephone call about the president's death remains unsolved. The JFK files, declassified in 2017, also contained notes about an unidentified caller in the UK who predicted JFK's death less than a half an hour before it happened. This call also was never traced, and its origins remain a mystery. Bashir Kauchakshi was a restaurant manager at the Marrakesh, a Moroccan restaurant in Washington, D.C. Starting in 1983, a mysterious caller or callers began calling the restaurant on a daily basis, harassing the employers. 
The caller would threaten the employees with death and attempt to extort them, sometimes yelling obscenities. The caller would call the restaurant upwards of 15 to 20 times per day. Kauchakchi received the brunt of the abuse, and the majority of the threats seemed to be specifically for him. Even when Kauchakchi was not at the restaurant, the phone calls followed him. Kauchakchi would often travel to Pennsylvania to work at a sister restaurant of his, and the harassing phone calls would begin as soon as he stepped foot in the building. For Kauchakchi, the harassment was reminiscent of when he was kidnapped and tortured in 1974 by the Palestine Liberation Organization while staying in Lebanon. In fact, Kauchakchi believes that the phone calls and his kidnapping are related, that someone was still trying to get to him from the kidnapping incident. Kauchakchi became so paranoid and worried over the mysterious phone calls, he began losing sleep, not being able to eat, and his entire life suffered because of it. Eventually, he checked himself into a psychiatric hospital where he still goes when his life is too stressful. The FBI became involved in the case and were attempting to trace the calls, but were only able to trace the calls coming from random payphones from across the Washington area. The phone calls eventually stopped after nearly 10 years, and Kauchakchi finally left the mental hospital. He never found out from where the calls came. 25-year-old Donna Lass worked as a nurse at the first aid station in a Tahoe casino. On September 6, 1970, she would disappear from the casino, never to be seen or heard from again. Various officers and detectives have worked on the case over the years, and many are under the assumption that Lass was a victim of the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer was responsible for a series of murders that took place in the 60s and 70s, taunting the police during his spree. And while there have been many suspects over the years, the killer has never been truly identified. What's interesting about the last case was that a man called both her boss and landlord, stating that due to a family emergency, Miss Lass would not be around for a while. Her boss at the casino was concerned by the call and called Lass's mother, who informed him she was not aware of any family emergency. If police are correct, and Lass was a victim of the Zodiac killer, it's likely he was responsible for those phone calls. The Long Island serial killer is a suspect in a string of murders which have taken place near Long Island, New York. Police have yet to identify the person responsible for the killings, but have been able to link him to several due to his alleged modus operandi. The killer appears to choose sex workers as his victims primarily. He dumps their bodies on Gilgo Beach or Oak Beach, all the women seemed to be strangled to death, their bodies wrapped in burlap sacks. 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew is one of the victims linked to the Long Island serial killer. Bartholomew, a sex worker who used Craigslist to find customers, had made an appointment with a client on July 10, 2009. Bartholomew was never seen or heard from after the date. However, a week after Bartholomew's disappearance, her younger sister Amanda began receiving phone calls from Bartholomew's phone. The calls continued coming over the course of six weeks, and text messages as well. The police were only able to figure out the general area that the calls were being placed from, such as Madison Square Garden. The caller harassed Amanda, asking her vulgar questions and eventually telling her that her sister was dead and that they were responsible for her murder. Eventually, the calls ceased, and it's assumed that the person responsible for Bartholomew's death was the one who made the disturbing calls to her sister. 49-year-old Charles Peck died in a tragic accident September 12, 2008. Peck was traveling from Salt Lake City, Utah to Los Angeles, California for a job interview. Peck's fiance lived in California, and he was hoping to find a job so he could relocate to be near his wife-to-be. Unfortunately, once Peck arrived in the city, he was involved in a Metrolink train crash and killed, along with 24 others. A total of 35 calls were made from Peck's cell phone after the accident to members of his family and his fiancée. Anyone who answered the calls was met 
with complete silence. Later, it was discovered that Peck died on impact from the crash, so it's unclear how those 35 mysterious calls were made after his death. On October 27, 1989, 10-year-old Amy Miljevic was kidnapped from a Bay Village, Ohio shopping center. Tragically, her body was discovered four months later in a field with multiple stab wounds. Although the killer has never been caught, the case remains open with police diligently trying to find the perpetrator. An odd fact regarding the case concerns a phone call that Miljevic received from a stranger the week of her kidnapping. The caller spoke to the young girl about her mother getting a promotion at work. They wanted to take her shopping to get a gift for her mother, but insisted she not tell her mother about the shopping excursion as they wanted it to be a surprise. While Miljevic did not tell her mother about the call, she did tell her older brother Jason, as well as a friend from school. Then she and the mysterious caller set up the October 27th date for the shopping trip, and that would be the last location she had ever been seen alive. The police investigating the case soon learned that Miljevic was not the only young girl to get a phone call from the stranger. Several other girls in the area received the same kind of calls from a stranger, informing them that one of their parents received a promotion from work and that they wanted to assist them in getting a gift. Luckily, the other girls ignored the calls. 26-year-old Brandon Lawson disappeared after getting into an argument with his girlfriend on August 8, 2013. Lawson, a native of San Angelo, Texas, left his home shortly before midnight with intentions of going to his father's house. Lawson ended up running out of gas on the way to his dad's place and called his brother to tell him where he was and that he had run out of gas. Shortly after placing the phone call to his brother Kyle, Lawson made a 911 call saying that he needed help, that he was in a field, and to send police. Lawson also mentioned to the police that he ran into somebody. Lawson's reception was bad in the area, and his phone cut out at certain points in the call, making it hard to understand the conversation. By the time police arrived at the scene of Lawson's abandoned truck, his brother Kyle, along with Kyle's girlfriend, also showed up. Lawson was nowhere to be found. Police did a thorough search of the area for Lawson, but have been unable to locate him. His phone, as well as his bank accounts, have not been accessed since his disappearance. 20-year-old Kelly Berg Dove worked third shift at a local gas station in Harrisonburg, Virginia. While at work on June 18, 1982, Dove began receiving obscene phone calls and became concerned enough to call the police about them. During the first call, Dove asked if an officer could come to the gas station to keep her safe. For whatever reason, Dove had to make multiple phone calls to the police before anyone actually arrived to check out the situation. During the third and final 911 call, a frightened Dove asked the police to come quickly, that the man was driving outside of the station in a silver Ford pickup truck. By the time police finally arrived, there was no sign of Dove, and she has never been seen again. The case remains unsolved today with no suspects. Sometime after 3 a.m. on April 6, 1986, there was a knock on the door of Penny Cayadetto's apartment. Cayadetto was asleep at the time and did not hear the knock, but Cayadetto's younger daughters recall their nine-year-old sister, Antoinette, going to answer the door. Antoinette never returned to bed in the Gallup, New Mexico apartment. Cayadetto noticed her daughter missing that morning and reported it to the police. Antoinette has never been found. A year after her disappearance, police got a call from someone claiming to be Antoinette Cayadetto. The girl explained that she was kidnapped and was brought to Albuquerque by her captors. Before the girl could say anything else, a man was heard in the background yelling, "'Who said you could use the phone?' The phone was quickly disconnected, but not before the girl claiming to be Antoinette could be heard screaming. The police cannot be sure whether the caller was actually Antoinette or not and was unable to trace the call. The case remains unsolved. 21-year-old Rebecca Gabrielle Nuno was last seen leaving work in Cedar Hills, Texas, May 31, 2005. Later that same day, 
a co-worker received a call from Nuno saying that she was kidnapped. Weeks after she went missing, Nuno called her parents and told them to stop looking for her. Her parents thought the phone call was strange because Nuno refused to speak English to them. Nuno has not been seen or heard from since. 20-year-old Amber Takaro from Misiku Cree First Nation in Alberta, Canada, went missing on August 18, 2010. Takaro was staying in a hotel with her one-year-old son and a friend of hers, and they planned on visiting Edmonton the next day. Takaro decided she would leave her son with her friend and attempt to hitchhike to Edmonton, where her friend and son would meet up with her the following day. Takaro was picked up by an unidentified man while she was on the phone with her brother, who just so happened to be in jail. Takaro became paranoid when the driver who picked her up began going a different direction than where Takaro had anticipated traveling. Due to her brother being in jail, the 17-minute phone call was recorded by the prison, and Takaro can be heard saying to the driver, you better not take me where I don't want to go. The driver can also be heard on the phone call, insisting he's taking Takaro to where she had requested. The conversation with her brother turned out to be the last anyone heard from Takaro. Two years later, her remains were discovered by horseback riders. Investigators released portions of the recorded phone call, hoping that someone would recognize the driver's voice. To this day, the case remains unsolved. 42-year-old Dale Dwayne Williams lived in Nukla, Colorado, where he owned a body shop. Despite Williams owning the shop, he was not a mechanic. That's what makes his May 27, 1999 disappearance so strange. Williams received a call from a female stranded motorist on May 27, and he went to assist her. Williams' friend was there when he answered the phone and knew he was going to help the person with their vehicle. The next day, when Williams' wife realized he hadn't come home, she reported him missing. Williams never was seen or heard from again. Approximately two months later, his truck was located, submerged in a river, but Williams was not in or around the vehicle. It's unclear who the alleged stranded motorist was or whatever happened to Williams. Up next, there are tons of people who got creepy phone calls, and chances are theirs have been just as bad, if not worse, than yours. Several Reddit users shared their tales of the creepiest phone calls they've ever had over the years. Those stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. I've often joked about how, instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout.
There are tons of people who get creepy phone calls, and chances are theirs have been just as bad if not worse than yours. Several Reddit users shared their tales of the creepiest phone calls they've ever had over the years. These may not have crimes attached to them as our previous stories, but nonetheless, these phone calls have kept people up at night for weeks or even years. Were they real people on the other end of the line? Ghosts? Versions of people from parallel dimensions? We'll never know, but it sure is creepy to think about. A few years ago, my brother would get a call on his cell phone around 2 or 3 a.m. every night. He'd answer, and it was this hellish-sounding noise, like static mixed with screams. He changed his cell phone number a month after this, and it stopped. But then after a week or so, it began again, the exact same noise, exact same time. Finally, one day, he decided to backdial the call. It was an old man that had no clue what he was talking about. Still, the calls persisted. If he didn't answer, he'd call a few more times. No messages were ever left. He decided to say screw it, ended his contract with his phone company, switched to a new one, and even got a new number. You guessed it, the screaming static calls continued after a short delay. By this time, he was terrified every night. Unsure why this was happening, he backdialed the number again and got a different person. Around this time, he lost his job and his phone. The calls stopped, of course. This phone was disconnected now. So one day, my mom asks me to listen to this weird message she got on our home phone. It was the static screaming. We showed my brother, and he was freaking out. He backdialed the number again, and it said the number had been disconnected this time. Never heard from it again after that. When my sister was young, my parents got her a personal phone, a landline, so that she could feel special. Yeah, she was extra spoiled. It was a prepaid landline, though, so basically no one could call in or out if she ran out of credit, much like a mobile phone. Anyway, every night at 3 a.m., her phone would ring. She said there was a man on the other line, and she'd get really scared and come running into my room. It escalated to the point that I asked her to please disconnect her phone before going to sleep because it became extremely annoying to get woken up every single night by this person that called her. Eventually, she just got rid of the phone. A few years ago, we were talking about it, and she confessed that her phone continued to ring even after she disconnected it, which is why she didn't want it anymore. She has no recollection of what the person on the other end was saying, or maybe she's just completely blocked it out. About a couple of weeks after I was born, my dad's best friend Jim died. They were really close, and one of the last things he wanted was to hold me before he passed away. Well, his wish was fulfilled, and a short time after that, he was gone. Fast forward seven years. I'm now a happy seven-year-old kid with a five-year-old brother and a recently born sister. One day the phone rings, and with my mom out and dad in the washroom, I thought it was going to be ignored as we kids were still too young to answer the phone. No call display at that time. We didn't know if it would be a stranger. But my brother broke the rules, and he answered anyway. Hello? Well, at this point, my dad's out of the washroom, and he's asking my brother to hand him the phone. He ignores him and keeps listening to whoever is speaking. Before my dad could ask a second time, my brother hangs up, looks at him, and says, Jim says hi and he misses Skywing Nova and then goes back to playing. The look of shock my dad had is what I remember most about this. Before my family and I moved to another state, my father visited the area to check on the progress of our new house which was being built. My father was there for a few days and was staying at some crappy Motel 6 in a shady area of town. His room was the last room at the end of the hallway on the top floor. In the middle of the night, on the last night he was in town, he was woken by the phone ringing in his room. He groggily answers. It was the front desk, and they say something along the lines of, sorry to wake you, but we've been receiving a couple of reports about rooms being broken into and some stuff being stolen. We're calling to make sure that you lock your door and you're safe. Well, my father replies that he's fine, and he hangs up. 
he decides to double-check that he locked the door. As he sits up in bed, he notices the door to his room is ajar. Well, being spooked, he cautiously checks out the room and finds nothing's missing, no one else is in the room, so he creeps to the door and peeks out. Sitting right outside his room on the windowsill of the hallway window is his shaving kit. Creeped out of his mind, he quickly grabs it and locks the door. After he calms down a bit, he calls down to the front desk and says, hey, you just called me about the break-ins around the hotel and I just want to report that my room was broken into when I was sleeping. Nothing stolen and I'm fine. Figured you'd like to know. The front desk replies, you must be mistaken. We never called your room and we haven't received any reports of break-ins. When I was a child, we would frequently get calls for a woman named Tanya. Didn't seem like a big deal. She had the same last name as us, although it's quite a common one around here. And when we moved across the city and phone books stopped being the go-to for finding somebody's number, the calls for Tanya gradually stopped. Those days seemed to have ended, and we carried on forgetting about the mysterious Tanya. It was about four years ago that she popped up in our lives again. I was driving home from work one afternoon and was greeted by a pretty grisly car wreck at the turn of my house. Two cars had collided, and one had wrapped itself around the signage pole that had house numbers and directions on it, one of which was my house number. Several days later, we get a call from the police. They asked if Tanya was at this residence. Her car was found wrapped around a pole down the street from my house, and she was nowhere to be found at the accident site. Haven't heard anything about her since. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. When I was younger, my family was extremely poor and lived in a very old mobile home on some land my grandpa owned. This piece of land was in a very small town out in the middle of nowhere Texas and covered in woods. The town itself was your typical small country town where football was king and there was nothing to do but get drunk or high on the weekend. It was also the type of town, along with it being the early 90s, where one didn't typically have to worry too much about locking their doors or setting an alarm. Now, our trailer was a two-bedroom, and my parents, always putting us kids ahead of themselves, slept in the living room on a fold-out couch. My room was directly connected to it, and my sister's room was down a hallway past the kitchen and bathroom at the other end of the trailer. One night, after everybody had gone to bed, my dad is woken up by a feeling that there's someone in the room. He looks around a bit and sees a large male figure sitting in the easy chair just feet from the bed. My dad quickly flipped on the light switch next to his bed and saw that it was a neighbor from down the road named Carter. Carter was known to be a frequent drug user and was often in trouble with the law because of that. My dad asked him what the hell he was doing here and told him to get out and he responded, I can't get out. The demons are chasing me and your house is the only safe one. My dad, who I should mention is fairly large and terrifying in person, responded that if he didn't get out and get out quickly that the house would be a lot less safe for him. If I leave, they'll get me, he said, 
They've been chasing me all night. If they catch me, I'm dead. My dad's response was that there were no demons, but that if he didn't get out of his house, he'd be dead. From what I've been told since I was asleep for that part, my mom also hurled a few threats, and while she may not be big, she is equally as terrifying. I believe it was her anger that finally scared the guy off. My dad got up and locked the door and watched through the blinds as Carter decided, since he couldn't outrun the demons, he'd steal our old beater Suburban that my dad always left the keys in. He drove around for about an hour. We called the police, and it took them about that long to get out to us, since the closest police station was about 20 or 30 minutes away. He finally brought it back and was arrested and taken to jail. He was deemed crazy and ended up locked in a mental institution. The scariest part is that for years after this, we would get phone calls where all we'd hear is music that would have lyrics like, I'm going to effing kill you. These calls lasted for years and followed us from house to house, even though we always had different numbers and would even be in different states. We always thought it was him sending us a message. The call stopped when I was about 12. I later found out that it was around that time Carter thought the best thing he could do for himself was soak himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. My grandmother died of brain cancer about 20 years ago. About two weeks after she died, I was hanging out over at my parents' place and my mom got a call. No number, no unknown number, just blank caller ID. She answered it got quiet, hung up, and went to her room without saying anything. When I finally got her to talk about it, she said it was her mother saying that she was trapped and please come get her because they wouldn't let her leave over and over again, and then the phone disconnected. I asked her about it a few years ago, and she denied that it happened for a bit, and then finally admitted that yeah, it did happen two more times that year, and then stopped but she didn't want to discuss it anymore. It was my first time staying home alone while my whole family was out at my brother's ball game. I was 13, I think. I'm on the phone with a friend of mine, feeling so grown up when someone beeps in on the other line. I tell her I'll be right back and click over lines. And then the creepiest voice I've ever heard says, Hello, little girl. I am the man in your basement. Honestly, I laughed it off and just hung up, thinking it was a prank call. I was a pretty confident little thing, and my neighborhood was pretty safe, so I figured somebody was just messing with me, knowing it was my first time alone. They beeped in again, so I clicked over and heard, Don't you effing hang up on me, you little bitch! And then the lights started flickering, and there was banging under my feet. I know it sounds crazy, but my dog started freaking out, and my cat ran away, so I assure you, I wasn't imagining a thing. Our basement was actually just an area connected to the garage. It wasn't finished. I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the garage steps to get into our kitchen, and I threw stuff in front of the door and heard yelling and whatnot. I kept trying to hang up and call the cops, but every time I tried, he was still on the phone. My friend told her parents what was happening, and they ran to a neighbor's house to call the police for me. I sat petrified with a broken rifle, a butcher knife, and a baseball bat behind my front door because it's the only place in the house downstairs that couldn't be seen from a window, and I was crying. Eventually, I clicked over to hear a police dispatcher on the phone, and they stayed on the line with her until the police got to my house. There was no sign of forced entry, though we had a broken window pane on our outside garage door that had been messed up for months prior, and my guess is he used that to get in. The police assumed I was just a paranoid girl and they were going to leave me home alone after they gave an all-clear. Fortunately, a family friend had been driving by and saw the cops there and stopped to see if everything was okay. He gave me a ride to the school where my family was. They were skeptical that anything had happened, but we did get a security system not too long after that and my parents both got cell phones as well. This was 1994, I think, so cell phones weren't super popular yet. After that happened, I swear there was someone stalking me for years. I'd leave my apartment locked and bolted and come back to find appliances on, hair dryer, stove, heat on in the middle of the summer. I lived in four different places and 
I'd get strange phone calls at every one despite being unlisted. Cars would be randomly parked down the road from the house and would speed up and slam on the brakes as I would run inside. I'd hear loud bangs outside when I lived out in the country. Nothing has happened since I've been in my current house and married, but I am still super paranoid all the time. This one night, when I arrived for work, my supervisor looked confused and asked me what I was doing there. I said, I work tonight, and he said, but they said you called in a few hours ago saying you were sick. Well, I was a bit confused and said, it must have been someone else, and they got the message wrong. Well, after everybody else showed up for work that night, it was a bit more weird, but we carried on as usual and assigned everybody their places for the night. I went to work in the control room, where I usually work. The control room is the center of the prison that has direct control over the cameras, doors, phones, and everything. After I relieved the guard on duty and settled in for the night, I looked at the message that said I called in. It said I had called at 6.50 and said that I had gotten sick while out cleaning up after the storm. There had been a storm the night before, and it was a bit bad, but not anything that I had to go out to clean up. It was truly weird. The supervisor came into the control about that time. He was also a friend of mine outside of work, and we started talking about it and how odd it was. I decided to call my wife at home and tell her about it while I was just sitting there, and I picked up the phone and dialed. After two rings, a man picked up the phone and with a raspy voice said, Hello? I didn't know what to say for a few seconds. I looked at the phone to make sure I had dialed the right number, and I had. After a few seconds, the person said, Hello, again, in that same raspy voice. I said, Hello, who is this? This is Taylor. Who is this? The person said. My head started spinning because my name is Taylor. I said in an almost scream, Where is Ann? And he said, Ann's in bed. Who is this? I dropped the phone and told my supervisor to ring me out. I had to get home, and I took off towards the door. I could hear Dave pick up the phone behind me and say, hello, followed soon after by, what the F, rather loudly. I ran to my car and drove home faster than what was legal, my mind racing the entire time. I busted through the door and my wife was sitting watching TV and was shocked at me being home. I asked her who was there and she said no one had been there. After a rather long talk with my wife, I went to call the prison to tell them what was going on, but the phone was dead. I went back to work, and when I came in, Dave was acting really weird and asked, how the hell are you doing this? He told me that when I left, he picked up the phone and the person on the other end sounded like me. He kind of freaked out and hung up the phone. A minute later, as he could see my car leaving the parking lot, I had called back from home and asked what was going on. He said that I was a bit irate and that I had said I was sick and didn't feel like playing these games and was telling him to stop prank calling me and then hung up. After convincing him I had no idea what was going on, we went back to work. Later, I find out that the phone line for my area had been knocked down the night before the storm. It's absolutely the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. Around the time I was 19, I was deployed to Iraq. My unit worked with bombs and, honestly, I didn't know I'd make it home intact. About halfway through my tour, the Red Cross notified my unit that my father was terminally ill. Within a week, I was on a plane back to the States. Now, my dad being ill was something I had grown used to. He was strong, though, and I'd never expected to actually lose him. I lost my mother when I was seven, and my father's lungs had collapsed shortly before then. He was on oxygen and needed a wheelchair to go anywhere. Medication by the handfuls were needed every few hours. He gained weight from limited movement, developed diabetes, and had already beaten cancer once. I never expected to lose him, and he wasn't the type to ever just give up. I arrive home, head to the hospital, and he assures me he's fine and that they're overreacting. I visit him every day I'm there, but he tells me that he'll be fine by the time I get home for good. Well, I reluctantly go back overseas. I call his hospital whenever I have a few minutes of free time and we're near a call center. My deployment finishes and he kept his promise. 
He comes home from the hospital because he says that he doesn't want to die there. And he gets worse, and then goes back to the hospital. The family all visits, but we know he's not improving. One day I'm at home, and the phone rings. It's an unknown number, so I don't answer. It goes to the answering machine, and a very raspy voice mumbles, Call the hospital. It's my dad's voice, so I grab the phone, but he's already hung up. So I call. They tell me that he's been intubated for the past couple hours, and he just started going into cardiac arrest. He's non-responsive, and we need to come say our goodbyes. I argue and say no, he just called me. They say it's not possible. They've been working on him for some time now. I hung up and told my family the news. My sister and I stared at the answering machine. We played the tape again and again. It was the last time I heard my father's voice. I'm a skeptic. I don't believe in the paranormal or ghosts, but I can't come up with any logical explanation. I still get watery-eyed thinking about it. Not my story, but my boyfriend, who for the sake of the story we will call Bob, shared this one with me. When he was about 8 to 10 years old, he's not sure of the age, he'd receive calls on the house phone from some mysterious guy. The guy would call when Bob was the only one at home, before his brother, who was three years older than him, would come back from school and when his parents were gone working. The guy would curse Bob out and tell him to shut up and to do whatever I say. The guy told Bob that he knew where he lived, he knew where Bob's parents worked, and he knew that Bob was alone. The guy told Bob that if he told anyone that he was calling Bob's home, he would kill his parents or him. Guess whatever was more terrifying that day. Being a young, scared kid at the time, Bob complied and would do things like take off his clothes while on the phone or dance around in the living room. Bob didn't tell me the full extent of the stranger's demands, but a part of me really doesn't want to know. So Bob entertained this guy for some time, again, didn't specify how long, until one day Bob's brother comes home and sees Bob on the phone. Bob's brother asks who it is, and after getting off the phone and apprehensive, Bob finally explains to his older brother the details about this mysterious caller. When Bob's older brother found out, the next day he came home early for the call and with a few friends on speakerphone told the guy to F off and that they'd find him with their posse and make his life a living hell. Bob lived in a predominantly Italian neighborhood where the mob life was very real. After they confronted the guy on the phone, the calls stopped, and they were never harassed again. I was 16 and working at an ice cream store all alone, late at night. It was the beginning of March in Canada, so the ground was covered in a thick layer of snow. I got a phone call. I can see you, a man's voice said eerily. I looked around in a panic. The store had huge glass windows on all sides. I couldn't see anybody in the darkness, and I cringed in shock. The man began to vividly describe how he planned to rape me. I was terrified, and as soon as the shock wore off, which seemed like ages because I heard part of his sickening description, I hung up the phone. It was disgusting. I was hysterical. I rushed to all the doors and locked them, and then I hid behind a counter with the phone. I was crying. I immediately called my boss and told him what had happened. I asked him if I should call the police. I know, dumb move, I should have just called them. And I was shocked with his answer. He said, it was a prank, open the store. That man was probably joking, go back to work. What a jerk. He wasn't even making money because it was 15 degrees below zero and nobody was coming into the store. But he wanted me to endanger myself by opening up when some creep had been threatening me. I called my dad, who was furious. He came within five minutes. I closed the store and he took me home. Needless to say, I never went back to work there again and never spoke to my old boss again. Most terrifying thing ever. Way back in fifth grade or so, I discovered a glorious Pokemon-themed chat room through the wonders of Yahoo. Within this chat room, there were maybe 15 regulars, generally between the ages of 12 and 16 or so, and we had a great time role-playing various anime characters and storylines. 
Anyway, I got to know a few people from there well enough to chat with them on AIM or by phone, and a few of those friendships lasted a good four or five years. One of these guys was a little eccentric. He loved creature and monster models and stories, stuff like Godzilla, Spawn, whatever. He believed in things like chupacabras, which I thought was silly, but I didn't really care, and he lived out in the boonies in some Midwestern state, which all seemed like hickland to my young West Coast mind. After getting to know him pretty well and having a good 100 hours of phone conversations over the years, he finally revealed this lovely story. He told me that sometimes he would black out and wake up to discover that he had or was still in the process of hurting or torturing animals and children. He had quite a few cousins and neighbor kids who lived nearby, and apparently he'd killed some animals. When he revealed that to me, I felt sick inside. I love animals, and this information chilled me to the bone. It was really hard for him to tell me this, and he confided that I was one of the only people he'd ever been able to tell. And then it got weirder. Someone in his family, or maybe a family friend, decided that he must be possessed by a demon and that they had to perform an exorcism. And they did it at night, of course, in a dark room lit by candles, and he was tied to the bed because they didn't know how the demon would react. He was choking up as he described this part. I could hear his voice quivering because he was so emotional and terrified at this part of his story. He described a, a pretty creepy process, too, but the worst part was the end. He said they heard something hit the floor under the bed when the demon left his body, and then something scrambled across the floor and out of the room into the darkness, leaving claw marks in the wood floor. He was totally and completely serious about this, and how it cured him and he didn't hurt things anymore. I, as any sane person would do, noped right the heck out of that situation. My brother once got a phone call from a man asking, how much are the girls going to cost? Thinking it was a prank joke, he said, 50 pounds an hour. But then the man followed up with another question, and they're all under 14 then? My brother immediately hung up the phone. He reported it to the police, who said the number was unregistered. I was working at a hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the graveyard shift. I'd been talking to the security guard, and he asked if he could get a ride home. So instead of waiting for 30 minutes for my shift to end, I just left and left a note for my boss that said I left early because my brother was stranded outside of town and needed me to get him. It was a total lie on my part, but I needed a good excuse to leave early. I drop off the security guard at his place, then go home and go to sleep. A couple hours of sleep, and I wake up to my phone ringing. It was my brother. He tells me he is stranded outside of town and he needs me to go get him. I tell my brother the lie I had told my boss and how much of a coincidence this is for him calling me like this. He says it's not weird, and he'll show me what's weird when I get there. So I get there and I ask him, okay, so what's weird? And he puts his phone up to my ear and he plays a message that he got when he woke up that morning. It's a voice that kind of sounded computerized, but mostly just creepy sounding, and it says, you're stuck. Freaked us both out. Never figured out where that call came from. Strangest, creepiest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Twelve years ago, my brother died, and for that whole first year, a lot of super weird stuff happened to our family. The only conclusion I can come to, and I do really believe this, was that he was trying to contact us. A week after his funeral, my mom was home by herself and the phone rang. It's about 2 p.m. The caller ID said that it was my brother's house, so she figured it was my sister-in-law. Mom answered, and when she said hello, there was no sound on the other end, and no one answered. She said hello again, and still no answer, and then the call disconnected. Well, she waited till about 6 p.m. when my sister-in-law came home from work and she called her to ask if maybe she'd come home from work and called her earlier. My sister-in-law said no. She asked if the kids had come home early. My sister-in-law asked my niece and nephew if they had come home to call Gran in the middle of the day, and neither of them had. They were in school the whole time till the end of the day. 
The phone was mounted to the kitchen wall and the receiver was on the hook, so it's not like the dog knocked it over and accidentally stepped on a speed dial. We think it was my brother making contact to let my mom know that he was still around. I was with my girlfriend Alex and we were making out when the phone rang. I answered it. What are you doing with my daughter? I heard. I asked Alex why her father would call me at this hour. What are you talking about? She said. My dad's dead. Then she gave out a laugh. Once, when I was a teenager, I was waiting at an abandoned gas station in downtown Akron to meet a dealer to buy some weed. This was in about 1993 or 1994, so payphones were still functional and in pretty common use. As I was waiting, the payphone in the parking lot started ringing. Bear in mind, it was an about sunset on the outskirts of downtown. Not another single person was around. Out of curiosity, I picked it up. The man on the other line asked, Is this Chad? Well, my name's not Chad, so I said no. The man ignored me and said, Chad, I want you to do bad things to me. I stated again that I wasn't Chad. I asked him what he wanted, if he knew where he was calling, etc. He ignored me again and went into very explicit and specific detail about all the things he wanted Chad to do to him, sexually. I was laughing at this point. I told him again I wasn't Chad. Finally, he said he knew for sure that I was Chad and described to me what Chad looks like. He described me perfectly, down to the color of my shirt and what types of shoes I was wearing. I immediately hung up and looked around. There was nobody, I mean not a single person around. I got into my car and I got the hell out of there. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share a link to this episode and recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share a link to the podcast, it helps spread the word about the show, growing our weirdo family in the process. Plus, it helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression, so please share the podcast with others. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction? Click on Tell Your Story on the website, and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Weird Darkness theme by Alibi Music. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Joshua 10 verse 25a. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. And a final thought. Fear is what stops you. Courage is what keeps you going. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>